belief is the enemy, is the enemy of knowing. All right, man. Welcome to Pro Triple Seven Radio. This is hour one of episode 496. Jason Lingren is with me, and Mike Williams, or better known sometimes as Sage of Quay, uh, has joined us. We're going to talk about music again. Uh, we feel like we've pretty much beat the Beatles. Uh, that's a bit of a dead horse. We may mention a couple things to put a bow tie on that, but we're going to broaden out into music in general. And I'm going to introduce the guys. And I'm going to bring up the charade that just happened with the band Kiss. Anyhow, welcome, Jason. And a rather hot good morning. And welcome back, Mike. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me back. So I don't want to come off like a gossip. That's not why I'm bringing up what I'm bringing up here. The tone and tenor of this is to kind of indicate to people what's been done and how culture has been shaped and, you know, how music was basically used as a tool, uh, an agenda, if you will. But the band Kiss, who has apparently said for the fifth time this is their last tour, I actually believe them now, they're getting kind of old, they insulted one of the original members of the band on Howard Stern, and he threatened that if he didn't get an apology, he was going to drop all this dirt. And I had called Jason, and I laughed. I said, wouldn't it be funny if Ace Freely from Kiss openly admitted all the things that we've been telling you have are true about the music we grew up with and love? And it turns out that I am reasonably sure he got a phone call that basically said, sit down and shut up or else, which is interesting because you could tell by the way he said things, he was a little worried about the repercussions because his magical papers were in a safe deposit box, like a dead key, right? If anything happens to me, he said, he'll release it to the AP, you know, to everybody. And I'm just bringing it up because it appears to me, this whole thing that has just happened that this organization is still protecting its secrets and has no intention of letting something like that happen. I mean, do either you want to comment on this kind of gossipy observation? Well, it doesn't surprise me at all, Crow. These antics as far as backing tracks and lip syncing and offstage, backstage musicians and singers has been going on since the very beginning. So, uh, you know, more and more information is coming out now. Um, In fact, it was one of the guys from Twisted Sister uh, this goes back maybe two or three weeks ago, and he actually came out. He's doing, I think he's doing managing and producing these days. And he talked about the lip syncing that Kiss does on stage. And what folks have to come to grips with is that's how it's done because the music industry is entertainment and there's big money involved. They're not going to take a risk that a show is going to fall flat on its face or the vocalists or the singers for that night are not up to speed or the playing is not where it needs to be. So, you know, they have all of these protective measures in place, for lack of a better term, to make sure that the show goes off um, without a hitch. So, you know, this is something you you know, Jason knows that I know that's been going on for a very long time. But to the average Joe Q public, they have no idea. They think when they go to a show that what they're hearing is actually the band playing. Now, there are bands that, that don't use backing tracks and uh, offstage musicians, but plenty of them do. So um, the point is, this is no surprise to me that this is coming out. A lot of this stuff is coming out now, in fact. You know, it's, what's interesting is when we did the last show with you, we actually got a couple contacts about people who had met doubles from big bands. And we opted not to pursue it for a couple reasons partially because we kind of proved uh, that Paul was a swap and anyone in their mind can put together if a personage that well-known can be swapped, then come on, you know, this is going on. It was a drummer. And I guess I won't say more than that, Jason, probably good practice not to, but of all the bands, Kiss would be easy to double because they wear makeup right. much easier than most places. But what's interesting about D Snyder, uh, he's kind of from a kitsch band, Twisted Sister, but they they had their they were sizable back in the day. They had a following, and they kind of still do. I know they've made their Christmas albums, which is kind of like the writing on the wall. But he showed up at Congress, right? Remember back in the day, he showed up to face down Congress on censorship. So it's interesting that he's still speaking out. He's had a lot of radio shows, but I'm of a mind, and I may look into this, and we maybe will put together something when we're well past 500 episodes. I am of a mind KISS never would have been 
if they hadn't had every support possible. It was one of the first bands I was telling Jason. Actually, I, I think I misspoke, Jason. My first band was, or my first album that I had in my possession was a Beach Boys album. The second album was Deep Purple Made in Japan. The third album was a Kiss album. And knowing the history of that band, I think this is a classic case of these guys were intended to go the distance and they got the backing they needed to get. They, In other words, had they been just regular guys on the street, they would have fallen by the wayside the amount of time it took them to, to find traction. And I don't know if either of you feel that way, but I think I could probably demonstrate it if I did due diligence. Well, Kiss's songwriting isn't really that great. Let's just be honest about that. Now, Kiss definitely had the machine behind them. That was the beginning of the, the overt Satanism that was being presented on stage. So, um, and, you know, to your point about double stroke, I had a person contact me going back a number of years ago. Maybe it was around three or four years ago. This person told me that they were addressed or a discussion was had with them on two separate occasions in two different cities. And um, he looks a lot like, quote, Paul McCartney or Billy Shears. And I know this because he sent me a picture. And from a starting point to create a double, he was a very good starting point. And he told me he was in one city. I guess he was on vacation with his wife. And somebody came up to him and said, hey, you know, you'd make a good double for Paul McCartney. And then the guy said to him, say something. So he had a, he has a Southern accent. So he said, well, they'd have to do something with the accent, right? It was very peculiar. So that was one situation. And then he told me that he was in another city traveling and somebody else came up to him with the same exact comments. So we can look at it as coincidence, or we can look at it and say that there's a possibility that they're scouting for doubles. And um, like I said, he sent me a picture of himself and I looked at it and said, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I mean, he would be a, a good person as far as his physical appearance, the way his, his face structure is and all that stuff. Uh, he, he's a great candidate to start creating a double. I'd never shown the picture because out of respect and privacy for the, for the gentleman, but, right. uh, but this is how, you know, this is, I think how it works. Uh, they're out there scouting and they're looking for uh, individuals and people that'll play into the, uh, into the theatrics. You know, this, there's another aspect of this we should point out. So often these little tricks are put right out into the public consciousness and it's done in clever ways where we pretty much just act like it's, you know, par for the course. Nobody thinks twice. Think of the old, you're old enough, Mike, think of uh, Mission Impossible. One of the big premises in that movie was, or in that television show that started in black and white, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> is they're having a pro problem with a country leader. So they go in and they drug them and they take them out and they replace them. And it's often a member of the team. And it was interesting the way they did it. Because at the end, you know, they, they're using the same actor, but they're implying that the agent now has a prosthetic on his face and a voice device so that it's all spot on. They were showing this back in the 60s. And now I realize why. I mean, what do you think? Do you remember that show where they were showing this all the time? Yeah. Yeah. It goes way back. We can go back and take a look at Stalin. And it's well documented now how many doubles he had. There's a very interesting conspiracy out there with regard to Jimmy Carter, that Carter was swapped out. I think by the time he got two years into his term, his hair was being parted on you know, the opposite side and, and all of that stuff. So huh. it's very difficult for people to get their heads wrapped around because you know folks don't live their life like that. So they go about doing whatever they do, go to work, keep a roof over their head, take care of their children and all that stuff. But the, the machinery behind the curtain, the stuff that they do, the average person has no concept. No, it, you know, it's the reason for conversations like this, because this is how we get fooled. Everyone loves music, right? You know, anyone who doesn't like music. And what's interesting about music is when you dissect how it's been delivered in this country, you can see how it's targeted. Like if you go to certain places down south, there will be different radio stations. This will be a country western place. 
or a country music place. You go to another place and you can see how it's been segmented, almost like red and blue, almost like the political thing. And you can also see easily, we've covered it, how a decade comes to an end and the whole flavor and sense. And that's a weird thing because since we passed the year 2000, I don't know about you, Mike, I don't know about you, Jason, but back in the 1900s, every time a decade was coming to an end, I could feel it. And when we got into the new decade, you could sense that things were different now. The 80s had ended, the, you know, the things are different. But since we have crossed the threshold of 2000, I haven't even noticed, or nor could I point out why the first 10 years of 2000 is somehow peculiar culturally to the next. And someone might say it's because you're old, Crow, but I mean, do you guys have the same, same idea where it doesn't feel like decades are the same as they used to be? The 90s seems to be the last of the original decades as far as modern culture, especially pop culture. It seems like just there's nothing all that identifiable. I mean, maybe if you got really picky about like certain ways with jeans and things like that, but nothing like the 60s really looks like the 60s, which does not look like the 80s, that kind of thing. Yeah. Do you notice it? Do you feel the decade division in the 2000s, Mike? No, I absolutely do. You go you back do. to the... You no, know, I mean, since 2000, I'm saying prior to 2000, let me just say it that way, I see a clear delineation between the decades. So to me, this is social engineering. This is homogenization. What you will notice, and I always use the example of cars back in the 60s, every color car you could imagine when a Challenger came out and it was successful, the other companies would have their muscle car that went against it. They'd be quite different. As a matter of fact, sometimes even unique colors would come with the car. That has gone away. Now, when you see a BMW of a certain SUV class and compare it to a Hyundai or, or other, they look very similar and the colors have been just muted down to not that many options. This is social engineering. And I think that's what we are seeing. As a matter of fact, here's one for you. I'm going to ask you both because you're both musicians. You're both better musicians than I am. Can you remember the last decade when key changes in popular music that you might hear on the radio or that's being sold typically as current music, when key changes were a part of the popular music last decade? What do you think, Mike? Well, the last decade has been just a, a miserable experience as far as I'm concerned with music. And it's all, in my opinion, very mechanical. So you're not going to have a lot of key changes and a lot of creativity like that in the music. They're not interested in creativity anymore. Right. What they're interested in is creating music that has a hypnotic uh, essence to it and um, is displaying and putting forth and normalizing their agenda. So at, at, as an example, what I mean by that is if we take a look at uh, these dance routines and these displays like at uh, – halftime and all that stuff with football, it's all ritualistic. So in my mind, that's where they're at right now. They're, they're no longer interested in really good, solid songwriting anymore because the good songwriting was something they had to do going back, starting in you know the, the 50s, going into the 1960s, especially in order to create the foundation that they were going to build upon. Right. So that's what they always do. They always create a foundation. And that foundation uh, is built based upon a broad acceptance of what Tavistock and the Frankfurt School and CIA expect or anticipate is going to be accepted from a broad perspective. And then from there, they move forward and they begin to make changes. And you're not hearing what you used to hear anymore. The music is getting worse and worse and worse, and it's not intended anymore to be a really a listening experience. It's, it's really intended to be a social engineering initiative or a social engineering project that is based in sound, frequency, and vibration. Which rap underscores. I exactly. mean, a, a lot of rap doesn't even fit the definition of music because melody and harmony and other things, if you look up the definition, maybe you would call it poetry to a beat if i want to be generous here comes the emails crow again yeah the emails will come i mean you know i'm sorry i badmouth my own music uh, i know what it was it was social engineering 
the difference is, is that way back when I was young and very into music, it was at least a little bit musical and actually less so than the prior decades. You know, you had big bands. Every person on that stage read music, had new music theory. But I was going to mention, Jason, if you had to guess, last decade where popular music commonly had key changes, what would you say? The 80s. Well, you're not far. Uh, the 90s, but it was diminished from the 80s. And so this underscores the point that Mike just made. The diversity, the complexity that music can have has been on a steady down trajectory as we came into the 80s and rock and roll was starting to burn itself out and what they like to call hair bands. It became, I don't know, conveyor belt music. And it's worse now, right? It is. It's very hypnotic. But can you imagine almost 30 years now of popular music without much key change. Uh, It's crazy to think about. And that kind of proves what music is used for uh, in in social agenda terms. So we're at the point where the music now is disposable. There's nothing coming out for the most part that's on pop radio. And, And when you think about what pop is today compared to what pop was in the 60s, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, that was pop music back then. The Who, like all those big bands, That was pop music then. Today, this computerized garbage with these ridiculous uh, characters that they invent to to center it on. I mean, this stuff won't be remembered 20 years from now. It's, It's computerized, quantized to death. It's too perfect. And it just sounds ludicrous, really. As a matter of fact, it sounds so bad that if you take old stuff, and I've listened to people do this on YouTube videos, if you take, say, like Boston, where that singer, I think his name was Brad Delp, and you throw it in auto-tune or Melodyne, one of those pitch correction softwares, and do it the way they do it now, it doesn't sound right. It's it's too good, the naturalness is removed, and it just loses its humanity. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jason. It loses its humanity. There's no longer a human element to it anymore. That's the thing, you know, um, you go back to the you know, to the older days, going back to the 60s and 70s, even, you know, in my mind, even to the 80s, there was still a lot of human input into the music that you were hearing. And today it's this very digitized, sterile sound. And you're absolutely right with regard to auto-tune and melodyne. I have a, a friend of mine who is a, uh, he's a sound engineer and he's been in the business for a long time. And he was telling me, now I don't use melodyne. And uh, I just, I do everything organically. When you listen to one of my songs, that's me, you know. But he was saying that uh, the technology has gotten to the point where if you play an E chord, an open E chord out of tune, that, you know, the software packages like Melodyne will correct it and put it into perfect tune. So you have to think to yourself, well, okay, what's that all about? And uh, what it's all about is is it's all part, it's all tied into the technocracy. It's all about everything is going to be technology-based, even your listening experience. Even something as simple as listening to music is just going to be bastardized by the technology. Soul removed. Yes. Spirit removed. Yeah. Can you imagine listening to some of the old classic Zeppelin, which tends to hold up? over the decades, put through Melodyne. I imagine it wouldn't even be listenable, right? Well, the, the natural, the little variations that someone, like a, like a singer like Robert Plant, the last thing you'd want to do is take that out. Even the Beatles doing a lot of those live harmonies they did, when they would double and triple their vocals, uh, they'd stand around one mic together. And of course, it's not 100% perfect, but it sounds thick because it's natural people doing real vocal tracks. Same thing with Queen. They would do... Like, I think it was like three sets of three or four, where the three out of the four members were singers. That's how they got that giant operatic sound. And then they'd mix all that together. So you had like 12 or 16 voices or something like that going on. You don't do that anymore. People just layer it and then throw it in the software and boom. Sometimes they don't even do that. Sometimes they're so lazy, they just duplicate tracks. And I've played around and done it, and I don't like the way it sounds. But you can just duplicate the main track and then just create harmonies off of that. So, of course, you have the same exact line uh, sung in the exact same way that's been pitch-corrected and had the life edited out of it, and then you're duplicating that and just putting in a different key, and it just sounds like a robot singing to a robot. Right. You know, I don't know if you guys are of a mind like I am, but 
I don't remember how long ago. It was a long time ago when I realized that I knew Paul had been swapped and that I began to realize that the Beatles is not what I once thought they were. With the work of people like you, Mike, and others, when you realize the scope of what a put up that was, it was basically, if you want to be honest, it was basically put together to be a social engineering apparatus. It was to deliver and program agenda. And when you know that's occurred and you come across the level at which things were done, then you can only move forward assuming that it's been done in other places. How can you not, right? Once you once you perfect a trick like that, are, are you going to accept that it happened once? Uh, I'm not. And so I started to look around years ago at the field of music, and I began to identify bands that in my mind, I think were complete constructs. And I want to get your guys' point of view. Um, I have not done the due diligence to back up what I'm going to say further than I have a very good intuition. And there are points along the way with things that I've seen that really back up what my intuition is telling me is true. Bands like Leonard Skinner, to me, that band's a put up. Kiss never would have made it had they had not had the full weight of intention and support put behind them. There are a number that I think we could say. And then you start thinking of bands like The Who. And I think it is clear as a bell that those big British bands were all agenda bands. So when we come down the line, what do you guys think? Are any of those big bands that we all grew up loving, are they free of anything that we covered when we started with the Beatles? As a, you know, basically this is a band as a social agenda tool. It's why it's here. It's why we made it. Go ahead, Jason. You go first. So the thing I've noticed being into music for many, many years is you don't get anywhere without knowing anyone. And when you're super young, late teens and early 20s, I've had this discussion with a good friend of mine who I've been in and out of bands with, played with for, for many years. You don't know jack shit and you just, you're so green. And that if you don't have someone taking you by the hand to help guide you, because this is the conversation we've had multiple times, we were trying to do all this stuff, and, and we had raw talent, and we had the gusto to want to do it, but we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And nobody who was older and experienced was bothering to say, hey, maybe you should just try it like this or try it like that. Even so far as paying for studio time, we didn't know any better, and we were just letting them throw an SM57 up on a guitar cabinet, and that's it. And nothing about layering and, and all the stuff that makes things sound like a professional production. No one gave a shit to be blunt. So... For these bands to have gotten as far as they did in the early days, they had to have had people guiding them because there's no way that they knew what they were doing, especially when you're going all the way back to the 60s when this stuff was new and people really didn't know what they were talking about. Well, when Mike, you're about to answer, let me lay, let me layer this on top as you respond here. In your mind, is it like you've heard the story, the young girl, the young boy going to go to Hollywood and meet their fame and fortune. That's the example. Is it even possible? Is it even possible to go find fame and fortune if you're at that level to, to make the top of the pops if you're not knighted in somehow? Anyhow, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a good point. It's a good setup, Crow, because the way I have deducted that it works is we've got three tiers, if you will. So the first tier would be those musicians that make up bands or as an individual artist that are bloodline connected into the controlling system, into the pyramid of power. These would be bands and uh, singers and artists. They're going to see very, very significant and prominent success and fame because they're bloodline. They're in the system. So they're going to be moved along. A lot of money is going to be put behind them to uh, to make sure that they get to where the social scientists want them to be. Then you have those that are not bloodline connected, but they are in secret societies, Freemasonry as an example. We'll just use that as the umbrella of secret society. And they are also moved along because they're going to promote the agenda. So we have the first tier, which is their bloodline, like Billy's bloodline. David Crosby was bloodline. And just by the sheer fact that they have that type of connection, it's assured that they're going to 
push the agenda forward. They're going to do what needs to get done. And then the second tier would be those that are in secret societies, regardless of what degree they're at. But, you know, the higher degrees they are in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the more they're going to be, uh, the controllers are going to be assured that they're going to cooperate and push the agenda. So, you know, these bands are also going to have money put behind them. And then you have this third tier. And this third tier are artists, bands that are not in secret societies, and they are not in the pyramid of power. However, they have resources or they have skills and talents that have been identified by the controllers that can be leveraged. Can you give an example of what that level a band might be that you view at that level? Oh, let me see. Um, let, uh, let's let's take a look at somebody like Britney Spears as an example. Okay. Just use her as an example, okay? Okay. Katy Perry is another. Performers. Performers. Yes, performers. And they're brought in because they can be shaped. They're groomed. They're handled. Now, were they groomed and handled prior to winding up on the radar, Tavistock's radar, or whatever social scientists? Radar? I don't know. We can debate that till the cows come home. Well, some of these people were musketeers. So what was going on there? E- exactly. Exactly. There's so the talent pool, right? Right. So that's right. So think of it exactly right, Crow. There's a talent pool. There's a pool of resources that are out there. And the controllers are always scouring it. And if they can make something of somebody, if they're going to fit the mold or the role of the next genre of music that they're going to put out and they're going to bombard the public with, they bring them in. But these types, they typically don't have a very long shelf life. They're used for a moment in time and then they're just discarded. But what about the the young African-American girl who was in a vampire movie, got really big and then cashed it on a plane takeoff? Aja, what, do you know who I'm talking about, anybody? Aaliyah. Aja? Aaliyah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So we have these, so we have these, these layers. This is what I have identified. You know, it's, it's one of those things where the controllers are, they're very creative and uh, their system is very sophisticated. And so, you know, they're, they're pulling from, from different pools of resources to be able to implement their agenda via the music industry and the entertainment industry, because what I'm talking about now is not just music, but it's also in the entertainment industry. If we take a look at Hollywood as an example. So, yeah, so the bands that are really, really big, you know, they're in it. I mean, they're in it because uh, they're actually tied into it from either a bloodline or from a brotherhood secret society perspective. And then the third tier are just those that they're bringing in and, and they're using them. They're just using and abusing them. Uh, just they just they just happen to be good tools at the moment, and as soon as that tool is no longer useful, then they get discarded. Even bands that maybe are not aware of the agenda, and then they get signed to a major label. We have to remember that it's not just about the music, but it's also the symbolism that comes along with it. So the album jacket will have all types of Illuminati symbolism. So the band may not even be aware of what that symbolism means. They just came in and they recorded their tracks. And But the way the record is packaged, and there are so many stories about songwriters and bands that have come in who've got signed to a label. Their songs got altered. Their songs got changed. So to, to, in order to fit what a producer deemed needed to get done in order to make that song, quote, marketable, which also includes, by the way, if an original band member was lay down the recorded track, let's say the guitar track, later on, a producer will bring in a ringer, a hired gun, and redo the guitar tracks or the bass track or the drumming. You know, so there's all this stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And the point I'm trying to make without getting too long-winded here is I believe, you know, there are there are bands and there are artists that are not immersed in the agenda and may not even be really aware of it, but they're still manipulated based upon how the songs are put together, how it's packaged, and how it's presented when they go out and they play live, as an example. Like the whole stage presentation will have pyramids on it and eyes on it, you know, all seeing eyes. I hope I'm making sense. 
Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to bring up some huge points based on the comments the two of you have just made. First of all, the idea of the throwaway people. Look at Britney Spears, good example. Look what happened to the poor girl. She right. lost her damn mind. Whether that was drugs or more, I think it was more. And the reason I think it was more is because of how the entertainment community felt sorry for her and swept in to try to be around her. But here's the thing about music like that, which is throwaway music. And by the way, you're not going to find key changes for the most part. It's been dumbed down, uh, which also dumbed down music has a dumbing down effect, just to be brutally honest about it. There's a thing called nostalgia programming that I first brought up with Jason. I think it was episode 76 moments before my YouTube channel was deleted because we told the truth about Mandalay Bay and the dark magic that was going on there based on Macbeth and the three witches. Nostalgia programming dictates some of the following things, at least what I am aware of. There's probably a lot that I'll never be aware of. When you're 13 or 12 and you love Britney Spears, when you become 40 and you haven't heard that music in a long time and you do, that will sweep you right back to that childhood, to those pleasant memories. Matters not the quality of the music. It's just that the music serves as that magical smell. You remember when you were young, that magical song, that magical time, your first kiss, and Britney happened to be on the radio. That nostalgia programming is among some of the strongest programming. So I want to make the point that even in so-called throwaway music, its day is not done when they're not recording anymore. In 20 or 30 years, the nostalgia programming abilities of that are going to be brought back on that generation. And to Mike's point about the packaging, I will just simply briefly bring up a thing called sigils. Um, The packaging matters. Geometry has energy, but if anyone wants to take a look at sigils, you can look it up on your own time. It's a little bit like Dr. Omoto embedding intent into water. That's basically one aspect of what a sigil is. What is a sigil? It's a shape. One of the ways you make a sigil, just to make the point, is you come up with a sentence of what you want to accomplish, then you remove all the vowels, any of the doubled consonants, and you make basically a logo. That's one of the simplest ways to do it. And you embed your intent and the meaning from the sentence that initially served as the foundation. You can find this on almost any album ever made in one shape or form of a logo or something else. But guys, I want to bring up the dead ringer here. I want to bring up Super Tramp. When I was in the 80s, I used to tell people Super Tramp is such an underrated band, such a great band. They're using interesting instruments. They're they're not a carbon copy. You know, you're not just hearing the same 12 bar blues you've heard to death. Um, But what we know about Super Tramp now underwrites what we're pointing out. On Breakfast in America, and words have meaning, they titled a a track and an album breakfast in America. If you look at the artwork and you turn it backwards or look at it in a mirror, it says nine 11, right in the heading. And there's New York city has put been put together. In other words, they're pre shadowing something like 22 years. I think it's the master Mason building number. I forget, but I think it's 22 years before the fact they're preluding uh, the nine 11 attacks. Now, if you take that band apart, you will find that first, one of the stories goes that some mysterious figure paid them a million dollars to get together. They went out on tour. It was unsuccessful. So they pulled them back and they put them through boot camp. And that's how they finally got them on the road making money. Uh, If you go look at where their albums were recorded, it's in old Masonic temples that had since been turned into recording studios. My point is is that Super Tramp is case and point for what we're talking about. And how can anyone listen to that band now knowing that their album cover preluded the event that tumbled us for good? The reason we are where we are now is because that event occurred. That is the beginning of the open fall of America. And for anyone who's not quite caught up, we are no longer an empire. We will not be the empire we once were. We will not be bullying people. We've been demoted, just to make it clear. And that's what I'm talking about. 22 years before the fact, they encoded the event, which had to already be clearly planned. 
Uh, they recorded their album in Masonic temples that had been converted over. And I just want to open up that conversation. I don't know what you two might know about the band, which really does underscore the proof that's in the pudding here. It's funny you should bring them up because before you said Super Tramp, I was thinking about that album cover. <laughs> it, and, it's a hell of a thing. Yeah, it's predictive programming is what it is. And yep. the, the point that you made, Crow, about the planning, this is something that a lot of folks really don't understand. The planning is not done like day by day or week by week. They have things planned out decades in advance, at least. Yes. That's why it's very difficult for folks to to get their heads wrapped around this because most people can't plan beyond a day or two or maybe even a week because of everything that goes on in their life. And then what people do is they take their own lives and extrapolate that and say, well, every everything works that way. And they don't understand that there is a controlling mechanism. There's a controlling infrastructure that controls the world. You know, I tried to explain to, to my audience, we've got organizations like the World Economic Forum, we have Tavistock, we have the Committee of 300, we have the Fabian Society, uh, we have the Rockefeller Foundation, we have the Bilderbergs, we have the Trilaterals, we have the Council on Foreign Relations, we have Davos. What do you think these organizations do? You think that, that they just create the buildings and play solitaire all day long? This internationalist structure is there for a reason, and it's because it's running the world, the whole facade that you think that your president is actually running something. I mean, it's even a bigger joke now with Joe Biden, right? I mean, but be that as it may, or that your prime minister, if you're out in Europe someplace, is actually calling the shots. I mean, you are very, very misguided and you're really not awake and you don't understand how the world really works. You know, so, so taking it back to the Super Tramp album again, you know, 20 something years ago. Predictive programming, you know, and we have lots of examples like that. I mean, we have examples like that in, in The Simpsons, for God's we do, sake. We do. <laughs> you know? it, isn't it astonishing that The Simpsons gets history better than the evening news? But right. with, with regard to Super Tramp, I want to make the point of how some of this magic works. You bought the music, you loved the music, you poured your energy, your spirit into the people planning this event. And just to make a point, it's insulting. And it's insulting only for people who have woken up from the dream. Everyone else is considered profane, a sheep, whatever they might want to label them. If you look at the album cover, they've taken the Statue of Liberty and turned her into a waitress. Her name is Libby. Liberty is a word that is used heavily in the military. It has nothing to do with freedom. When I was in the Marine Corps, if I got liberty, I was informed how many hours of liberty I had. And then it was over. Right. The back of that album is about a meal. It's break fast. So 22 years, I think it was 22 years before the fact, they were announcing that they were going to break the fast and go open operational. Now, you will notice she's holding an orange juice. Orange is the only color that reduces numerically to 33. It also represents the sun or maybe even wait for it, the May sun. There is so much that has been put into this album work that you learned to love long before you comprehended, most still don't, that it was pre-echoing one of the most horrendous things that's ever happened to this country that put us on the trajectory of where we are now. A country that is facing cryptocurrency that is programmable, that will slave out everything you do. You can buy this, you can't buy this. You can go here, you can't go. That's where we're going. This is all based on the broken fast or the breaking of the fast to go operational. We're in the open. Everything we do now is on the evening news because these people are so freaking spellbound. They can't even distinguish their own index finger from their toe. These are the ideas behind it. But I want to make that point because Mike, you and I remember album covers. Jason, to some degree, you do too. It was a whole experience. That album meant so much and it had such an importance. But that artwork, when used to evil ends, we have given it our energy, haven't we? Yes, that's exactly right. And that's another thing I explained to my audience. There's two types of energy. There's your, your spiritual or non-physical energy, your consciousness, and then there's your physical energy. So they steal your non-physical or consciousness by having you focus 
on these bands or these entertainers and these celebrities. So as you're focused on them in, in the land of occultism and magic and ritual, they're harnessing that energy. And it doesn't matter whether the audience believes that that actually takes place. This is what the priesthood, the magicians and the occultists believe. This is what they practice. So they're capturing your consciousness. They're capturing your thinking. They're capturing your focus and your concentration. And by doing that, they're able to steer you. Like Crow was just saying, you're looking at the album covers or even singing the songs because a lot of these songs have backmasking in them. And uh, right. Uh, right. so when you're singing them and you're humming them in the song from the, from the perspective of an occultist, you are engaged and continuing the ritual. Now, the physical energy that they're usurping from you would be you buying the records, buying their merch, going to the concerts. Physical labor. Physical labor, because you have to actually work. You have to physically go out and work to make a buck. And then you're taking the money that is left after they steal it through taxes, and you're giving it back to them in the form of buying record CDs, DVDs, merchandise, and so on. And I have explained so many times, Pro and Jason, to, to my audience that we have to stop the idol worship because that's really what it is at the end of the day. Think of these rock stars and these entertainers and these celebrities. They're an intermediary, right? They're like the lesser gods. And if you watch the, um, the series American Gods, it talks about the new gods are the technology gods. And that's what they do. That's how they usurp your non-physical and your physical energy. It's, it's by pulling you into this pop culture, into social media, into the music and into the entertainment industry. And they, they pulled that. That show got too close, I think. They pulled that right in the middle of its popularity. Yeah, after three seasons, it got pulled. And, uh, but it was, in my opinion, it was a very important series. Yes. Because it talked about the old gods and the new gods, and the new gods are the technology gods. Right. And this is this is what's playing out. No, it was a very important little piece for someone who eyes to see with, and it was so blatant that they were doing similar things to test how awake you are. They kept doing these drone shots or aerial shots where someone would be on black talk that's all cracked. But if you were paying attention, you would realize that the cracks spell somewhere in America. Yeah. They were being very specific, but one of the biggest things that came out of that, that relates exactly to what Mike and I are talking about stealing your energy. And actually it's not a theft you're giving it, but I'll just call it stealing because you don't comprehend that you're in a transaction. So you are being duped. They did a, a God named Vulcan who did bullets and guns. He made them manufactured them. And this is where they tipped their hat in a way that I've never seen it tipped before. One of the guys that came with the main God who was portraying Odin, an old God, he always carried a sledgehammer and he worked in a slaughterhouse, killing pigs, hitting them in the head with a sledgehammer. Every one of those pigs was a sacrifice right. being collected, a blood ritual. Now, the guy who made the guns, they made the point by showing on the butt of the bullet where it might say Winchester was his claim. It had his little sigil, the little symbol, and his name. And uh, while the new God, where the old gods were saying, where can we get our sacrifices and our worship? He was living high on the hog because every one of those bullets has the potential to kill someone. And when it does, or it hurts someone, they collect the ritual blood sacrifice energy. And these are bridges that are so far for most people, but I'm glad you brought that up. Mike, is there anything you want to bring up when, when we come back in the second hour I'm going to bring up the idea that fame is on loan. I'm going to use Prince, and then I'm going to delve further into the idea of worship that you just opened the door for. But is there anything else you'd like to get in the last few minutes of hour one? The only thing I can think of, Crow, is when we talk about worship, I explain again to my audience that if you're going to invest your focus on someone, it needs to be yourself because you need to develop yourself as an individual. It's, it's a soul's journey. And your soul came here to have the experience and to learn. It's about soul development. And by doing what they're doing, the technology gods, what they're doing is that they're keeping you from realizing and manifesting who you are as an individual and as a sovereign soul. I've said to folks, the controllers want you to focus on community. It's communal stuff. When you do that, 
without first developing the individual aspect of yourself, that you're going to have a weak community. So as an individual, you have to work on being creative, resilient, resourceful. And then when you have a creative, resilient, and resourceful number of individuals and they come together as a community, then your community reflects those attributes and those characteristics, and you're going to have a strong community. This is why they, all the time, they take the individual out of the equation. They don't want anybody talking about individual development or a focus on individuality. They pour it all into the, the communal bucket. And that's why we're, we're at today, because we have very weak uh, communities, uh, whether it be you know local communities, national communities, worldwide communities. It, it really doesn't matter. Most people have lost their individual sovereignty, and they're not coming from, from that perspective. And this is why we have the problems we have today, because people are relying on people outside of them to fix the issues. So when you don't develop your individuality, what you're doing is you've actually given up your authority. You've disempowered yourself because you handed the authority over to somebody else outside of you. And when you do that, you empowered the people or the entities that are outside of you. So all the people who are on TV telling you what it is you should do and not do, what's safe and what's effective, all of that stuff, People who are following their leads, you have abdicated, you have given up your will, your authority, and your empowerment, and you handed it over to those types. You know, it's a good point because underneath it all, you've forgotten what applies to you. And what applies to you is the idea, and it's deeper than the idea of sovereignty. I am. You should think about that. You should go back to the Bible and read where that's said, and you should consider what it means. And then consider in every spiritual tradition that I think has value, you will find, don't go looking for the creator all over, look within. Right. And now think about what it means to say, I am. It's exactly what Mike said. That's why communism is such a difficult thing. And unfortunately, I've lived my entire life with nine of the pillars of communism in place in this country. People say what's coming, what they're going to try to do is some kind of a bizarre, extreme techno communism you know it remains to be seen but i now have many people who agree with me that are way more spiritually adept than i am that say what's about to happen is going to fail in the long run we're going to wrap up our one here when we come back i'm going to open up with the idea that fame is on loan a friend of mine named dave j who was one of the early voices online he did not pull punches he did not ever shy away from what he felt was right. He was censored off every platform all the time, and it never stopped. And he came up with an idea about fame that I have since furthered, but it's right. I know it's right. We're also going to outline what is worship. Do you have a good idea in your mind of what worship is? I'm going to get into this because Mike bringing up American gods, American gods put more on the table than I've ever seen any modern show put on the table. And then they cut it. They cut that umbilical cord right as it was picking up. Jason, anything you want to get in before I have Mike tell folks where they can find them? Well, I think the big thing we have to uh, really consider here is how bad the cult of celebrity has become. And (laughs) the cult of celebrity was so big around the Beatles, just to use them as the ultimate example that that mystique is still lasting to today. It is. It's it's constantly refostered. And with the new movie and all the AI nonsense, I am convinced that uh, there are portrayals of people like Lennon that were made by AI and inserted in there. I am convinced of it. Uh, Whether I could ever prove it, probably not. Anyhow, Mike, why don't you tell folks where they can find you and your work, and then we'll prep up for hour two. Okay. I just want to say uh, off of Jason's comment, the the cult of the Beatles, I can vouch that it's very much well and alive. (laughs) It's there, very strong. To reach me, contact me, uh, go to my hub website, sageofquay, S-A-G-E-O-F-Q-U-A-Y.com. And all of my links to my work, my music and all that stuff is there. So it's one-stop shop. Right. There it is. We're going to wrap up our one of episode 496. We're going to take a few minutes to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to nail a important hour two. I'll put it that way. Uh, we've got the right people here to do it. With that, uh, you can catch the first hour of any episode at crow777radio.com, C-R-R-O-W-777radio.com. 
We have just syndicated the hour ones on the blockchain, believe it or not, on World Wide Web 3. Uh, was it Chat Garden? Do you remember the name, Jason? Oh, we're going to look that up again. Yeah, we're going to have to look that up. I can never remember. Anyhow, I'll put it out in hour two. With that, I would like to wish you all a happy, healthy, and higher-minded new era. And I hope to see you with membership on the other side for the full two hours. By the way, all members get access to Shoot the Moon, the two-hour film that Jason made about my telescope work. There it is. We'll see you shortly. Cheers. All right, now, welcome back to Pro Triple Seven Radio. This is hour two of episode 496. Jason Lindgren is back, as is Mike Williams, or Sage of Play, and Rose Ping Me. I can never remember. I don't know why it's so simple. Uh, the blockchain that's housing us uh, on the World Wide Web 3 is called Cast Garden, and we've put all our first hour content out there. Um, part of it I did intentionally because of the blockchain, but that's a whole other conversation I'm not getting into right now. Welcome back, guys. Good afternoon. Welcome. All right. Let's jump in where we promised we would. It was years ago, and there were a few early voices that are among the people who influenced me the most uh, on YouTube in terms of, of what we've been doing all these years. One of those was Dave J, and he did not pull punches. And he, I mean, he run into a fire headlong if he thought he had a reason to do it. He never shied from anything. And the result of that was they just removed him from everywhere all the time. And he brought up the idea of what fame is. And I've since walked with it away. So what I accept is correct right now is fame is on loan. And here's how I frame it up. Imagine one day you're just somebody, let's just use a musician, and you want to be famous until you are knighted. Uh, you're not. At some point, someone says, okay, we're going to do this album and market it and make you huge or you know, however it goes, whether you're an actor or anything else. And at that moment, if you honestly assess what's just happened, you're basically telling someone you're going to basically live like a king, kind of, from here forward. You're going to have money. You won't need money. Um, you don't really need a passport. You can go wherever you want. You're going to be treated differently than a so-called civilian. But that's on loan. And I am now con convinced by personages such as Prince uh, that they knew exactly how long it was on loan. The first album he put out that made it big was Purple Rain album, right? It was, I think it's 1983 or 84. Might be 84. I don't know. But in it, uh, if the elevator tries to get you down, go crazy. Well, he's, you know, they portrayed him as dying in an elevator. That was pre-echoed in a Rick and Morty when the uh, scientists formerly, or the scientists formerly known as Prince, or however they did it, they made a version of Rick who was Prince, and they showed him killed in the elevator before Prince was killed. But here's the thing. Prince knew it. And the whole time that he was fighting for his contractual life, he knew it had to do with his name. That name is what's on loan to you, right? When your name is made famous, I'm convinced that a lot of people probably don't even, does Britney Spears own her own name? I don't know. But, um, you know, that's maybe not a good example. Take, take the name of a big band. Who knows who owns the rights on that? They'll show the public as if the band does. But what he did is he ditched his name and went to an unpronounceable symbol, proving that he knew the problem had to do with the name. So let's open up the conversation there. Yeah, I think this goes along with what we said in the first part, Crow, where they own you. If, if you're going to achieve any level, significant level of fame and fortune, there's going to be concessions that you're going to have to make to get there. They dangle the carrot. And if you want more, they'll give you more. But in getting more, there are going to be things you're going to have to do, things you're going to have to participate in. There are going to be consequences. And, you know, and there are going to be things that you're going to get involved in that you normally wouldn't touch or you wouldn't get involved in. But, you know, if you're chasing the paper, you're chasing the fame and fortune and you really want it and you can taste it, you know, people do certain things. And so his name, Prince, there's got to be a contractual agreement in place, which um, said that as an individual, I doubt that he would be able to go off and do something 
under the name of Prince without having significant legal implications and complications in trying to do that. I mean, we see this with bands that broke up. And they want to go out and say, uh, you know, I'm trying, trying to think of a band. Off the Credence top of my head. Clearwater Revival is one, right? Right, right. I want to go out and be Credence. And then, oh, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. No, you cannot. Fogarty is another. Right. It's a machine. It's tied together with contracts. There's tons and tons of money involved. And forget about the whole control mechanism. Just think about it from the standpoint of the greed of the money. And there's going to be a lot of artists that are going to be stifled and not even realizing that they're going to be suppressed or stifled down the road because they really didn't understand what it is they signed up for. So at the time when the whole Prince thing was happening, I mean, there was a beer being released. I don't remember all the things. I think uh, for some reason, Hoover, one of the big dams was flashed purple right as it was happening or something like that. Uh, there were so many indicators, something to do with the prince's or the queen's birthday, if I remember correctly. But there were so many things. But one of the things that really stuck out to me, and Jason's probably going to have to help me with the name of the song from the band America, the first time this country ever heard these two words put together, as far as I know, Purple Rain, was in an America song. And it's a whole verse. And it basically talks about a guy named Joe, which was one of Prince's aliens, aliases. And it says, you know, what are you going to do? I don't know. It's okay. You can always change your name or you can do these things. It looks like you've been hit by Purple Rain. Do you know that? Is it Ventura Highway, Jason? Uh, yeah, I believe so. So I think it's Ventura Highway. It's, um, but that was written in. And so I started chasing this down. And as fate would have it, the internet was in full swing then. Someone had reached out to the supposed author of that song and said, why did you write that verse? And he responded, I couldn't tell you. And it was just thing after thing where you could see, like, is it really possible that a big band like America back in the day is prepping up for a guy that we're going to hear about in the 80s? The thing we should also note is the word rain. And uh, I was actually rereading Daniel Esterlin's book on Tavistock and Mm. um, he has a, a couple of pages dedicated to Rain Man and a lot of rap and hip hop artists. I think Eminem is one of them. They have the, the lyric Rain Man. What does that mean? Well, Rain and Rain Man implies a deal with the devil, deal with Satan. It's a pact. So when they sing about Rain Man or they sing about rain, the first thing we should think about knowing this is are they communicating out that there was a, a pack, there was a going to the crossroads moment that put this artist front and center? Like even the Beatles song, Rain, the Who, Rain on Me. Spelled as a reigning monarch, spelled not like rain on your head, but as R E G, you know, it's right. like a monarch reigns. Exactly. So, but it's, they do wordplay all the time. You guys know this. Think about how many times in videos, Album covers, you see an umbrella, rain. So this is something that I want to point out too. I, I had, a, I found a link to it. You won't find much on Rain Man. It seems to have been scrubbed <laughs> because of Estelin. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably because of Daniel's book. Uh, but I did find one link which was uh, very informative, and uh, this is something that I presented out to my audience about, I, I guess, about two or three weeks ago, as it pertained to the Beatles and the song Rain, but. There are a lot of songs that refer to rain and or rain man. And from an occult perspective, it's pointing back to a pact. It's a deal that you made to get where you are. And pulls in the symbolism of the umbrella. Yes. Anyone who wants to read Daniel Estlin's book, I know exactly what he's talking about. I've read it a few times. Uh, I even referenced it and took research further. Some of my uh, world population research was based on where Estelin started and some of the clever methods he laid down. That's how I leveraged off to do mine. By the way, Rose just pinged me. um, When Prince was dying, the queen released a purple rain beer, which is spelled R-E-I-G-N, to rain as a queen would. But this is the thing. I don't think... I think most people have it in their minds that they could become famous. And I don't know what you guys think. I think maybe occasionally that happens, but I think it's like less than a fraction of 1%. I think someone 
is chosen out for whatever reason, or even groom maybe, but think of the idea of the America song. If all that's correct, and all those 40 years or whatever it is prior, they're queuing up for a guy named Prince or someone who's going to sing uh, a song that makes him famous called Purple Rain. As a matter of fact, think about this. So he then goes on to play the biggest show in the world, which is Super Bowl halftime. You know, one, one of the biggest shows in terms of how many people are watching. That is huge. And what happens is he opens up with Purple Rain. It rains. So you suppose they did a little weather mod there for him, or was that all just chance? Uh, we can't answer these questions, but I am completely convinced that the idea that you have talent and you head off to Hollywood and find fame and fortune, I don't think it works that way. What do you think, Jason? Do you accept that, that it works that way? I think there's a percentage of them that are probably just money makers. They're there because they need extra fodder, but the biggest of the biggest of the biggest pretty sure that's a setup for one reason or another. And Mike broke down the tiered system, and I think that's probably pretty accurate. It's crazy to consider because, you know, what is the culture of America? What I, The way I say it is we watch some movies and we like some TV shows. Oh, yeah, and we listen to some music. So basically what we're talking about here is how culture is shaped. Yeah, I don't think, going back to Jason's comment, I, very few bands, I think, are organic in the true sense. Going back to the three tiers I, I spoke about before, even if a band is talented and they have talented songwriters and they're very good musicians, the record label, which is all plugged in to, to the controlling system, plugged into Tavistock and so on, it's going to be packaged in a way to ensure that the controller's agenda gets communicated out. So one way or another, if you're recording on a major label, you're plugged into the system, whether you know it or not. Yep. And like Jason said, for the big bands, there's no question that they're in on the agenda from, from day one. That You just don't get reach that level of fame and fortune and notoriety. I think they're always going to need openers. Yeah. If you want to call them that, like they just need some extra bands. Right. So maybe they're not necessarily aware of what's going on, but it doesn't matter because uh, they're still on these labels or they're, they're still with this management company and they're going to get them somewhere. And all, all these things are still going to be done to them, whether they know it or not. Right. It's like what Jason, um, excuse me, what Crow said before, we're talking about the sigils, right? So let's just say a band puts out a record. Let's just say hypothetically, it's, it's organic. They wrote all their own stuff. They're great musicians and all. And then the record company puts the, the record out and the front cover is a gigantic pyramid. You know? <laughs> right? I, I think of the earth, wind and fire. Uh, album covers as an example. It was just loaded up with all kinds of Illuminati, uh, uh, Egyptian mystery symbolism. That's how they do it. You know, it, it's not always the band members, like you said, Jason, being completely awake and aware of it. They may not be at all, but the controllers, the the labels, like I said, you know, they're a big piece of of this agenda. They're going to make sure that there's going to be some piece of their agenda that's going to be communicated out especially visually, because people love the visual aspects of it, right? So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. You know, I'll mention one more thing about Prince before we move on to further the example that we're putting forth for people to consider. Think about how he became famous, right? It's like, let's, let's think of, how about Fiddler on the Roof, right? You may have no interest in Hebrew history or religion or anything, but there's no arguing with the, mu the music of that movie, right? They knew when they went to go put that together that they had music that was going to do what music does. I would suggest to you that the Purple Rain album was that. But what did they do? They ponied up for a, a picture, right? A, a, a film at the same time. So as they broke this big album, which exploded at the time, it was put everywhere by the movie that accompanied it. And in the movie, other people that probably would have been mostly unknown also were buoyed up. Uh, the girl Vanity or maybe Morris Day in the time, but I don't know too much about that band, actually. But I'm just pointing out that it has every appearance that someone somewhere greenlighted this. The funds were made available and the machine went to work. They knew they had the music because there's no arguing with the music. Uh, either it's good music or it's not. And they had the film to go with it. 
And I, I always equate that to things like the popularity of, of the movie I mentioned. Uh, it's really the soundtracks that have, have done all the work there. But that's maybe enough of Prince um, tried to make the point. Let's, let's move on. You know, what is worship? And I think that the movie or the uh, HBO special that you brought up called American Gods went a long way to demonstrating what worship actually is. What's a good example? So in society, you know, a guy who's fallen madly in love with a girl and, and you say to that guy, well, you worship her. Well, what are you saying to him? Why would you use those words? Well, because he's, that's all he thinks about, right? His whole life is concentrating on this new love of his life. But what is it actually? And if you watch American God, you'll get a good idea. But let me ask you something. If you're a person who holds your cell phone for let's say eight hours a day doing one thing or another, could that be considered worship? I'll open it up. What do you think, Mike? It's it's conditioning. It's <laughs> it's brainwashing at the very least. Uh, you've been uh, conditioned to hold that phone, bring it with you everywhere, look at it, even aimlessly. In other words, you are bored, as an example, and you're just going to scroll through your phone and all that stuff. But you're worshiping the technology. Maybe I should say it that way. I like it. Right? So you're you're brainwashed and conditioned to being connected to that phone. There's no reason to be connected to it, folks. That's the thing you have to understand. Because years ago, when you didn't have these phones to take around with you, it was actually connected to the wall in your house. Life was okay. You got along just fine. If somebody called you, went into the message machine or whatever, and then you got back to them when you were able to, and things were, you know, like I said, they were fine. But the worshiping piece of it, it's the... uh, (laughs) How about the game Tetris? (laughs) They're about to put a movie out on Tetris. Yes. Can you imagine if someone came up with a way to know how many hours in the world had been spent on the game Tetris? I would argue that that's a form of worship. Yes, yes, you're worshiping the technology. That's what you're doing. You're you're dedicating enormous amounts of time of your life doing that versus something else, something more productive, more creative, more imaginative. So that's what I said before about them stealing from you or removing from you your focus and your concentration, your consciousness. That's how it works. So you're going to tell me that there, you can't think of anything better to do in your life than to stare at your phone six to eight hours a day. And if you answer, well, that's what I like to do, then you're a lost soul. I'm sorry. <laughs> Consider traditional worship. This is how I got there. When I lived in Newport, Rhode Island years ago, in 99, I had moved in there. There was a Baptist church, and I was always so impressed with how into it they were. They would go there dressed to the nines, everybody in there dressed to the nines. They wouldn't just go for their hour, hour and a half. They were there from seven, eight in the morning, well into the afternoon. You could hear the music. They brought food there. They were serious about their church experience. And I always admired them. And it was primarily people of color, by the way, a Baptist church in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, but my point is think of how we typically would worship. So in where, where I grew up, Sunday was supposed to be the day of worship. Now, until I was 14 years old, my mother held up her end of the bargain that she agreed to when I was adopted by my parents, that I was to be raised Lutheran and she did not drop the ball. She did raise me Lutheran. She took me and my brother every Sunday as we got older, she had to bribe us. But our idea of worship was you drove in on a Sunday, I think all told, it might have been an hour, probably closer to 45 minutes actually in the sermon there where what are we doing? We're worshiping. Well, what does that mean? It means we're paying attention. We're dedicating our energy and our focus to biblical concerns. That's our worship. And then I started to imagine gaming as an example. Can you imagine if you took that the hours of a lifetime, the average young person has put into gaming and had translated that to some other endeavor in the world, how much they could have got accomplished. And I think that's really what we're looking at here is they realized with the technology, they could get, even if you want to call it something other than worship, I kind of think it is worship. You could really consume a significant portion of life. Like if you consider 
I'm, I'm awake for two thirds of the day and asleep for one third of the day, they could put you back to sleep for another third of the day on average. I'm just saying, I mean, what do you think, Jason? <sighs> Worship is such an odd thing. And I see so many people getting wrapped up in, I don't think they're living life. Let's put it that way. I think that there's so much more to life than most people realize. And by getting up, uh, wrapped up in something as stupid as a phone, I remember the 90s before all these phone things kicked off, and uh, we did get along just fine. Now, I did know people with pagers, but that's beside the point. And life was fine, and we'd actually go out and spend time together. I, I sometimes make fun of this when I go into a coffee shop, for instance, that, hey, do something crazy, like actually talk to the person next to you instead of staring at an electronic device. <laughs> and they act all insulted when you say hi. <laughs> yeah, people look at me funny like, what? <laughs> Yeah, so many, so many lost people with that stuff, with the technology. I, I just think it's consciously, you know, the more I learned about AI when we covered it, uh, I, I became, it all started before I read the book by Shoshana Zuboff, which was a big old four inch thick book, which the first real book that I knew about written on AI. And that's what opened the door because I'd already been looking at the wisdom of the crowd and the law of large numbers. And what I began to realize is what they're doing here is these programs estimate you've got this many million seconds in your life. How do we get them all? And that's how I began to realize that all the search returns are, you know, based on your worship, you're interested in whatever you are. They then put a hook in that. Oh, here's a link for that girlfriend you knew in seventh grade. Oh, here's a link. You know, I know your hobby is this. And what they do is they try to get every second. And to me, that is a form of worship to grab a human being's attention for these extended periods of time. But if neither of you have more to add on that, I've got a place I want to go that I think is pretty important. Well, before we came back on the air, we were talking about how people in this part of the world were being fooled so easily back in the 80s and even the 90s. And part of it, in my view, was due to having been brought up and taught to think linear. Even time is linear. You know, nothing is cyclical uh, in the way we were taught. Very, very few things are cyclical. And so what would happen, which is well demonstrated in the show American Gods, is we see a new name and a new costume. And so we automatically assume that's a new person. As a matter of fact, if and I know people will go back and watch this, which I think is actually useful for a rare change. Um, there's so much packed in there. What it deftly did is show this guy, Odin, he's also Wednesday. He's also Woten. He's like, he's 50 people. And a good example that they do is with Easter, the goddess that plays Easter. And what it demonstrates is what I think the sun originally taught people. And this is, is what shows up in the devil's pulpit, that we couldn't crack the code because of the way we think. What it basically shows is if you look at the sun, in let's say June, it is not the same thing as the sun in September. Fall is occurring, but it is. It's the same actor, if you want to use that. It's just put on a different name and a different costume. So I truly think that the sun is what taught actors to start acting. And what goes on is a single actor changes an appearance, a costume, a name, and that's where we get lost. We think now that's a new personage altogether when in fact it's not. And I think that's key. I mean, what do you think, Mike? Well, it's basically something that we see today, uh, even in pop culture, where it's a remake of a person. It's a remake of a movie. It's a remake of a song. You know, they just dress it up differently. But at its core, if you go back to the original version of it, you know, there, there is an original. And, uh, but people don't think in terms of going back to the very beginnings of anything or to do the research to do that. And what they do is they just grab onto whatever comes to their attention or whatever is in their awareness at the moment. And that becomes a defining moment that becomes definitive to them. So they, they don't spend any time comparing. They don't understand when we talk about gods as an example that it's ubiquitous across Many different times during history, different cultures and, and, and different eras and different ages that uh, many of these gods are, uh, they're the same God. 
it's just that they were given a different name and they were maybe dressed a little differently and maybe a couple of attributes and characteristics were changed here and there to me, you know, so that it didn't map exactly to a previous God. But, you know, it's uh, your point, I guess, Crow, is, is that it all does go back to a central source or a beginning where that's the foundation. And from there, it, it kind of takes on a life of its own as we go through different periods in time. People in general don't have the bandwidth to research this stuff and to really understand it. So whatever it is that's presented to them at right now is what it is that they believe it is and what it is that they accept. You know, the other thing is the refashioning. And that's the last thing I'll say about American gods, but the idea of media, the word that we use as media and all recognize, they track that back to an original kind of Greeky, gaudy sense. But so let's switch back over to music. Do you two still have bands that you respect as somehow free and clear of the things we've been talking about? You know what I'm getting at? Yeah. That, that, okay, go ahead. It's a good question. So I'm, I'll give you my answer. Not really. And uh, because the work that I've done looking into the Beatles and the music industry, but especially the Beatles, because, you know, they're, they're basically, when I talk about foundational types of things, uh, they are foundational to the music industry. So what I have done is to move more toward independent artists, Crow and Jason. So as an example, back in 2021, I released the great indie playlist. So I have a lot of musicians and artists uh, some producers that subscribe to my uh, my YouTube channel, especially my Beatles channel. And uh, I had them submit their songs. And uh, so one song per artist, and it had to be an original, no covers. And I did the same thing uh, a couple of months ago for 2023. What you find is that there is a tremendous amount of talent out there that is organic. And it's not tainted by the agenda of the controllers or the record labels and the producers and all that stuff. So my, my quick answer is that there are very few bands that I used to listen to all the time when I was growing up that I look at today and say, yeah, you know, they were organic or they were not tainted or touched by the system because it's not true. I know it's not true. I know in one way or another, they have been touched and tainted and contaminated by, by the controller's agenda. So I, I lean today far more toward uh, indie music. That's my answer. Long way of saying it, but that's where I've landed. I think what you just said is critically important, but what about you, Jason? Knowing what I know, I just assume that any major band that I may have come into contact with throughout my life has some sort of manipulation to them but some more so than others. I know you and I have had this discussion. I don't see Pink Floyd, for instance, who I really like, having been anywhere near as much of a manipulation tool as, say, the Beatles. Just too many problems surrounded the band. Uh, Sid Barrett was a casualty of the psychedelic era, compounding his own mental problems that seemed to already be there, that kind of thing. Not saying that they weren't being used for things because they certainly were helping to push the psychedelic narrative in the late 60s and go get drug, drug out. use. Drug use, yeah. But even the way they fought later and all that, it just seems like that uh, they weren't quite the tool for manipulation that other bands were. But on the other hand, I completely accept the fact that maybe they were. And I don't care. I appreciate the music for what it is. And I logically detach myself from that aspect of it. It's like, okay, well, I know what the music business is. I know what the entertainment industry as a whole is. Can I still appreciate Dark Side of the Moon for being an incredible album? Of course I can. Yeah, that's a good point, Jason. I'm in the same boat. I can still go back and listen to these songs and appreciate the, the musicianship, the songwriting, the craftsmanship behind the songs. But I listen to it with a discerning ear knowing what I know. So I can, I can still go back and listen to Beatles songs and say, you know, that's a really good song because you know why? Because it's a really good song. (laughs) Plus the nostalgia of it, right? You were young, you were young. That's going to draw you back. And the other part of it is we're freaking starving out here for some decent music. 
So, so many, even the young people now are going back to, I think predominantly 70s and 80s rock has caught on with a younger generation. Now I see it all over bands propping up that are doing Zeppelin. But as far as Pink Floyd, I did the same thing, Jason. I thought, come on, David Gilmore, there's never going to be a time you convince me that someone else bumped him out of a studio to do his guitar part. He's that good. You know, he's that good. Not only is he that good, that sound is unique all the way through. There's no breaks where you'd be wondering, is that really, did Gilmore write that lead? It's a Gilmore lead. You can hear it. But here's what I began to notice because I didn't want it to be true anymore. And of all the bands that I still do listen to, Pink Floyd is among them. I acknowledge a lot of it's nostalgia. I acknowledge that it's because I'm suffering for a freaking key change around here. But there was a concert when Prince died where Gilmore did Purple Rain. Ding, 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 ding. And guess what? Guess who came up on the stage? Crosby Stills. You know, it's all the world's a stage. And to be at that level, I don't think you're independent. And how do we begin to address things like how many hundreds of weeks was Dark Side of the Moon at the top of the pops? I mean, I think that means something. So I went through this too. And one of the bands I tried to do it with is Rush right? So of all the bands I could think of, I I thought the stories that I'd heard of them and what I think I know of them, they seem to be the least kind of mainstreamy in my mind for some reason. But at the end of the day, it, it is what it is. The story with Rush is they were about to be dropped by their label. So they said, F you went off and created 2112 because they could, whether that's believable or not, I don't know. When, when your record label's getting ready to dump you and they expect an album. And so they risked it all and they put 2112. And at first, nobody cared. And lo and behold, some DJ in Chicago or somewhere started playing it. Lordy B, it caught on like wildfire. From that day forward, no one ever said boo to rush again. They wrote their old ticket. Or, and I'm just saying, are any of these things possible? Or is the real truth that when you get up to a level, you're going to play ball, but that does not address the initial thing that we asked. Is it possible to be Rush if you're just a kid, random kid in high school who wants to be in a rock band? Is that possible? And so, and for me, we've answered. I love Mike's response for the following reason. I started to have a real hate, love, hate relationship with the music I grew up with because I was so pissed off that I knew I'd been a, a tool I knew I'd been programmed by the very thing that I loved and learned how to play and basically worshiped, if you want to be honest about it. And so I started listening to other kinds of music. As you know, Jason, I got mandolins and other things, and I did what Mike did. I went indie. And what I, what I started to do was, in my view, mandolins are really hard to play. So I started really admiring people that I could find that could shred on a mandolin. I thought, that's some pretty serious skill. Those things are very difficult to play. And that led me into different genres. And it basically, it led me back around to classic music. And the reason for that was, is because of its complexity. And what I noticed is when I first went back to classic, I could really only sit down and listen to the ones we all know, Claire de Lune, Beethoven's Fifth. I mean, you know them, all the ones that were on Bugs Bunny. And eventually you start to recognize how diverse and how eclectic and how higher-minded the music is. And that's what led me in. But I saw your list, Mike, and I admired that you did that because I knew why you did it. And I think it's a good idea. Yeah. And the other thing I want to say before we move off this topic is even when bands argue with each other, we have to understand that, especially with a lot of these large bands, they're Freemasons. They're in the Masonic structure. And the Masonic structure is a corporate structure. It operates the exact same way. And so they are made, uh, opportunities are made available to them, but they still have to vie for position. They still have to compete within the Masonic system to move up the ladder or to become successful. The thing is, because they are Freemasons and they're in secret societies, they, they have the opportunity to do that. They have the opportunity to at least compete, whereas you and I do not. We are outside that pyramid. So we're not going to see those opportunities and we're not even going to be able to have the opportunity to debate or fight with each other as band members and split bands up and regroup and do this and do that because we're not in the club. 
You know, so it's not one of these things where it's always smooth sailing for these bands and these band members and these artists. They're humans, after all. I mean, they are. I mean, they have a different philosophy than than we do, but they still have human emotions like anger and stuff like that. So when I take a look at some of these bands and these stories about them breaking up and who hates who and who's fighting with who, and then they get back together again to do a to reunite and so on. I mean, I look at it as well. Okay, but at least you have the opportunity to do that. Whereas somebody like myself, you, Jason, you, Crow, or any number of folks who are listening to this right now who are musicians and artists, and, you know, in bands, you're not going to have that opportunity. You're just not. No, there's no backing system of fights. No, fight. but I think I can underscore what you're saying with the character of Kramer. Does everyone remember Kramer from Seinfeld? Yeah. I will remind people that in the 90s, there was nothing bigger on television for a period of time than Seinfeld. I've mentioned many times that in San Diego, and this is in the 90s, the street was empty everywhere in San Diego. I think it was a Thursday night, if I remember correctly, the last episode of Seinfeld, which was a two-parter. But Kramer went out to be a comedian. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm doing this from memory. He was filmed calling a black man a nigger or something like that. Yes. That went viral. If I further am not misremembering, he made it to the cover of Masonic Monthly magazine shortly after that. Does anyone else remember what I'm saying? I remember the situation. I remember him making the comment he made on stage, but I don't recall the uh, Masonic magazine cover. I'm going to look it up real quick because it's a big deal. Maybe if Rose is listening, she can. Yeah, there it is. It's on Scottish Rite. He's on the cover of Scottish Rite. September 2000. Maybe if Rose has a minute, she can tell me if I've remembered correctly that he made this album cover after he was filmed in a nightclub using a derogatory term. Now, we should also remember that to use the word nigger back then was not as outlawed as it is now. It was catching up. It was about to be. But the way I remember it is that he was filmed racially slurring a black man that had heckled him and then shortly after, he was put on the Scottish Rite magazine cover, which would lead me to believe that he was directed to do what he did. Yeah, a lot of that stuff is scripted, Crow. Folks don't want to really believe that. There's a tremendous amount of scripting that goes on. You know, are there? Is it common for people of color to be Masons? Does anyone know? Yeah. I don't. I, it is? They have their own Masonic lodges, yes. Yeah, the Prince Hall Masons. So wait a minute, they're segregated? Like there's a, a black mason is not with a white mason? Yes and no. Up until a few decades ago, absolutely, it was segregated. The Prince Hall Masons were for black folks. That was it. Really? They've had to uh, get over that, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Uh, so black people can now be in the regular lodges. But you still don't see it very much. Yeah, I, 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 as I thought about it, I... I began to think, wait a minute, I don't think I've ever seen an African-American associated with masonry in the way that I've seen so many white people, which made me wondering, but um, we'll look it up. I'm sure someone will tell me if I remember correctly. Pretty sure it went filmed doing a racial slur that goes all over the evening news coast to coast, and we know what the media does, and then, then the magazine cover. I hope I don't have that backwards. But another good example, and we've got to touch on it. I mean, come on, even the name of the band, Queen. Everyone assumes that it was a sexual name, which is a little bit interesting because as far as I know, there was only one non-heterosexual Freddie Mercury in the band and the other three were. So doesn't it seem a little weird that you would name your band Queen on those terms? But let's pull it back to reality. Androgyny was huge when Queen took its name. But have you guys noticed that since Freddie's passing, Queen has been getting paid God knows how much money their music is in everything. It's on so many commercials, advertisements in the movies. Have you guys noticed this? Yeah. I've sure. noticed that Queen is still front and center. And he, if I'm not mistaken, the head of that band is an astro. Brian May. Yeah. yeah Brian is he May. An astrophysicist. Yes. Right. But there is a definite connection to the royalty somehow. And who can forget him with his regal sounding guitar which is another piece of this because it really does have kind of a regal sound to it standing on, I think it was Buckingham palace, right? Do you remember that Brian may being filmed on the top of the palace playing whatever it was he played? 
I think I might have missed that clip, but it doesn't surprise me. Well, he's also been knighted. Yeah, he's been knighted, but I think he might have been playing the national anthem or something. But I mean, how can you ever? Oh, there it is. She just wrote me back. So Kramer, whatever his real name is, I've forgotten. Uh, he made the N word comment in 2006, and he makes the cover of Scottish Rite in 2003. So I did have it backwards, but it shows, right? Yeah. Now with Queen Crow, I, I think it's, it goes both ways. It points back to the crown, but also Freddie was like Rock's version of Liberace. You know, <laughs> he, he really was. He had two different meanings. One pointed back to the crown and, and back to the queen. And the other one had to do with the agenda at, at that time when it really was hot and heavy with, uh, with homosexuality. Here's an interesting thing. Did you know that Freddie Mercury, I think, was supposedly trained as an illustrator or something like that in an art college, as so many of the British bands were? He's credited with designing the Queen logo. So you've got the Phoenix there, um, which more, but did you notice that the crab which would be cancer, which would show up on an astrological read in many usages at 12 o'clock. But a crab, many crabs have blue blood. So it's kind of encoded right into their their logo, the blue blood connection. Yeah, I I know that he designed the logo. I didn't know about the art school bit of it, though. Pretty sure he was an illustrator, if I remember correctly. But I'm I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Not 100%, but that crab, you know, when you look at it, you're all, and I think there was actually some versions of this with a pelican or something, but it's clearly a phoenix, and there's also much occult meaning. The crown is dead center in the queue, and above that is the crab, and people wonder why it's there. Well, for one, it's the zodiacal sign. Remember when David Bowie, who was a cancer, died? I think it happened in the sign of the crab, and his age was 69, which is the symbol for the sign of cancer. But the thing about crabs is they're encoding the blue blood idea. So there, there's definitely a connection, but queen always stuck out to me as completely insider baseball. And they went to some weird studios along the way to record too, by the way. Yeah, no question. They were (laughs) plugged into the pyramid. No question. They're an example of a band that actually had significant talent though. If you watch any behind the scenes of them in the studio, for instance, You'll see that those guys actually have what it takes, but obviously we know that they're uh, they're playing ball. Well, that's interesting too, because the one member, John Deacon, seemed to have distanced out. But what's interesting, and I wasn't aware of it, he apparently still manages in some capacity, either the money or the actual management. Um, but he left the stage part of it. I thought maybe he was furthering himself. But while we've still got time, let's bring up an interesting one, Cat Stevens. Don't you guys think that is so interesting, what happened with him? He was at the top of his game. He could have sold out arenas anywhere. And he walked away and decided to become full-time Muslim, learned the language, did everything. As the story goes, I think, was apparently told that it wasn't very Muslim-like to be a rock star. So he quit singing for a period of time. That since stopped. But isn't it interesting to see someone walk away from the highest heights of fame and fortune in that manner and the way he did it distanced i mean all the way out of the culture right all the way from western top of the pops to other side of the world speaking a new language i remember when he made the uh the switch because i used to like a lot of cat stevens's songs you know i was a very good guitar player um but when he turned to islam at the time, I thought, I mean, why did he do that? But now that I think about it, Crow, I think to myself, well, maybe it was in it was a way to call attention to Islam, considering what was going to be on the radar in the future. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. But uh, yeah, it was a very, it was peculiar when it happened. No question. I saw a concert and I, I, I'm trying to remember that it's the last concert he did. I don't know if it's true. I would have to look, but he's singing Father and Son, the famous song Father and Son, where he basically says, I have to go. It's right in the lyrics. And I think I remember him wearing the uh, the garb of the Middle East, whatever you call the white, long, flowy robes, um, which actually there's a spiritual reason for reading. Anyone who's read The Light of Egypt knows that it's not spiritually inclining to wear tight things like socks, shoes, and belts and such, bras. Um, That's supposed to be counterfeit, but I think it's a good example. And maybe I'll look into it at some point how he was just, I mean, he literally was an A-list rocker, right? 
And it was mostly just him, usually accompanied with maybe a drummer, another guitar, not a lot of people. And it was him. He was front and center. And when he walked away, he walked all the way away. It's just interesting. It makes me wonder, is that what it takes to get out from under whatever you're doing? Pull the religion card saying, I'm going back to God. And, you know, go ahead, Jason. He was at the top of his game. So you got to wonder, did he see things or have to be involved in things that maybe he didn't like very much? I think it's interesting, too, that it had to do with religion, right? Because if everything we've said about law is true, then maybe he didn't even own his own name. When he goes out on the stage now, they use Cat as kind of a byline, but now he's Yusuf Islam, right? That is the name that's usually portrayed. And then they remind people that he was Cat Stevens. So is this an absolute stamp of authority of someone going back to the highest source to get out from under the dark cloud that their name has tied them up with. I don't know. I'm speculating. Yeah. Like I said, I, I can't discount that it wasn't scripted <laughs> as well. You know? Yeah. I mean, who, <laughs> you can't prove a negative and you can't prove this for certain, <laughs> but, but at some level you can yeah. because it becomes overwhelming. But at this point, I'll, I'll say where I am at, at this point for folks, I'm actually putting a room by room audio system in, and it's not a big deal. It's just some speakers in each room. The reason that I've decided to do this is because I am very sensitive to frequencies. And so I will bathe my home and try to imprint my home with what I feel are positive frequencies when I'm about two miles away from a almost 400 foot cell tower, two miles away. And I think at night I can hear it. I've imprinted my room, but nonetheless, will I go back to the music of my youth? And it is the answer to that is yes. Occasionally I will listen to those things now. Maybe I don't listen in the same way. And to be honest, maybe now I listen for the talent more than I used to. But I also know that what's happened to me is I will also listen to bluegrass. I will also listen to classical In other words, my genres have blown open where I used to be pretty particularly a rock and roll kind of guy from a pretty specific period of time, although I was also a punk rocker. So where are you guys? Knowing what we know now, how do you treat the music that we grew up loving, Mike? I still love a lot of it, Crow. Um, But like I said earlier, I, I... I'm discerning now when I listen to it. The luster, as far as uh, believing that the the artists or the band members that were involved were actually on the recordings and actually wrote the music, a lot of that is is gone. I mean, with the Beatles, it's completely gone. Um, so what now? It's it's down to I have uh, I can have an appreciation for the the songwriting. I can have an appreciation for the arrangement and the production. Uh, a good song is a good song. That's how I I look at it. But I don't spend a lot of time these days uh, listening to what I used to listen to when I was younger uh, because of what I know and the work that I've done. So I, I do go back to the, uh, to the indie types of music. So you can hear a lot of it on Reverb Nation and SoundCloud and so on. And there's a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of really, really good musicians and songwriters and singers that will never see the light of day because of the way the, you know, the system works. But uh, my view is that's who I'm going to support going forward. So the, the, the quick answer is I still listen to some of the stuff I used to listen to, but I've, I've, I've weaned myself off it for the most part. So I'm going to get Jason's, how Jason has found his balance. But one of the things I really love is the people who are maybe in their 20s going back to Zeppelin and playing that in their bands. I really enjoy that because it's different. It's not, it's not straight off the album. It's people who love the music for the reason they do, but I just like hearing the skill level of the younger people covering those. But Jason, how do you find your balance knowing everything that we know now? Well, a lot of what I listen to these days, as far as the mainstream stuff, I'm listening to it to understand production because I'm so into the gear, the studio, sounds, layering, all that kind of thing. I love listening to it and trying to figure out, okay, so how did they do that? That sounds amazing. How, how did this technique come up and how can I replicate that? Or how could I take that and apply it to the music that I write? Do you feel like you spend as much time, like when I was younger in a given year, there would have been a lot of Zeppelin, a lot of Floyd hours, a lot of basically just what's come to be called classic rock, along with certain bands from the punk rock genre. 
for me, it's, it's less. And I'm a bit like Mike. Now I've become much more eclectic. And by the way, I have a growing interest in classical music for the simple reason that I'm really interested in unique talent. Like I can go on YouTube and find guitarists that can probably play faster than Ingbe Malmsteen. They're out there, but that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in a musical skill level that's not a carbon copy, that's not just the 12 bar blues over and over and over again. And in that, it led me to classical to recognize how complex 18 to 20 different instruments put together is. And I'm finding real enjoyment. And also in bluegrass, I find a lot of very good musicians in bluegrass that is different than the rock. But I, I find myself listening to less than I used to before I knew everything I knew. So, Mike, what do you have on the horizon? What are you going to be up to? Well, I have a new um, presentation out, which is called The Addendum. Did the Beatles write all their own music? And I really do believe that it definitively closes the case on whether the Beatles wrote all their own music and uh, played on all of their recorded tracks. So uh, if you go to my hub website, uh, you can hit that video. It's about two hours and 45 minutes long. It, it picks up where my uh, original presentation left off. So the original was uh, back in April of 2020. So I just released this one this month. And uh, right now what's going on is I am working on releasing a third album. So I'm actually in the middle right now of finishing the 10th song for the album. The album's going to have 10 songs. So a lot of my focus is, has gone to that. And I'm going to give the Beatles stuff a break because I really am beetled out with this stuff. And uh, I really am. I mean, I'm going at it now for seven years. And, you know, it gets to the point where it's diminishing returns. And once you feel like you've made your case, you've made your case, you know? So uh, that's where I'm at right now. I'm going to spend um, a lot of time with my wife. We have a grandson. Uh, he's eight months old. So Congratulations. Just going, that's yeah, a big deal. Good for you. It is a big deal. And we love it. And so we're going to just, you know, sit back and uh, enjoy the, uh, the, the more simple pleasures in life. And it's not to say I won't hop into certain things when I need to, but uh, you also need a time out, take a break, relax, recharge. You've got to do that. You can't be consumed with this stuff because uh, it's a big, murky whirlpool of stuff. And I don't want to spend my time there all the time. Well, you know, at some point, whoever, quote unquote, Paul McCartney is, and not that I wish ill on anyone, but he's not going to be here forever, especially if he's five years older than, than he claims to be. I'm sure there's going to be things for you to look at all over again, because that's going to change a lot, I think. Well, I was told by a, uh, a source of mine, a friend of mine, who uh, occasionally hobnobs with the beautiful people, that uh, he has some health issues as we speak. Well, anyone yeah. who's in the approximate 80 age, you, I mean, you're really not in the pinnacle of health anymore, are you? Right. No, things happen when you get older. I can vouch for that. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I can vouch for that. Um, <laughs> I'm lucky to have met some of the people I met, or things would be very different for me right now. But the music business is called the music business for a reason. It's just that most of us don't realize the importance of entertainment and that it's not just a business. It's also co-opted as a culture creation tool, as a dumbing down tool as it's been used. In my lifetime, what popular music has done has fallen. It's plummeted. The complexity, having people who call themselves musicians, who once upon a time knew music theory, knew genres of music, were very skilled at their instrument to be employed as a musician, all that's out the window now. To be called a musician now, you could create, record things that have absolutely no melody, no musical theory, no nothing. And that will pass for music now. As I mentioned, we're about 30 years away from key changes of all things, the most basic thing in music, a key change being part of things. But Mike, let's close with this idea. You were pointing out three movies, which I think are helpful to people to show them what was actually true of the music industry that built everything that music sits on now. One of them is called The Wrecking Crew. Uh, what are the, what's the name of the other? Oh, uh, Muscle, Muscle Shoals. Shoals. Muscle Shoals. Uh, and what's the other one? Hired Gun. Hired Gun. So The Wrecking Crew in this country probably played as big a role 
as anyone were aware of. But let's talk, as we can, for a few more minutes about Glenn Campbell. This is a key, key point. Glenn Campbell could not read music. If you asked me to point to a better guitar player in the world than Glenn Campbell, I don't think I could. Truly, I don't think I could. And he was part of the Wrecking Crew. But here's the difference. He was handsome as all get out. And he stepped out of the studio musician wrecking crew who were writing or recording the music for all the biggest bands that were coming out of America, Lord knows where else. And he became famous in his own right. Isn't it interesting? And what do you suppose all those musicians like there's Harry Nilsson is in a clip saying, basically, I wrote Beatles music and I was never credited. There are other people in the wrecking crew who have come close or maybe even hinted that I wrote all this great music and never got anything for it other than a studio fee. And then we have Glenn Campbell, who was talented beyond belief, but he became famous in his own right. And when he made his albums, who did he hire? He hired the wrecking crew. Are you aware of all that, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. So, and the thing is people bring up Glenn Campbell a lot and they say, well, Glenn Campbell couldn't read music, so the Beatles couldn't read music. So if he if he couldn't read music and, and be an exceptional guitarist, why does that not apply to the Beatles? I mean, Glenn because Campbell- they didn't film them. <laughs> That's all you got to say. <laughs> Glenn is on film everywhere, shredding with the best of them. There is no Beatle footage of that type. Yeah, well, and Glenn was a virtuoso. I mean, there's yes. no question about it. There's plenty, plenty of footage of Glenn Campbell playing his guitar, and he was just a magnificent guitar player. Now, not everybody who is a great musician, reads music. But the great ones are great. And they can sit in with any group of uh, musicians or a band and they just adapt immediately and you know they take the song where it needs to go. So that's what people have to understand. You know, you can't take one person, a Glenn Campbell, and then say, well, that applies to all of these other people. It, it, it's just, you know, it, it's a silly way to, to apply logic. You know, it's case by case. And that's how you have to look at it. There's footage of him at some point saying, you know, I couldn't read music and that was going to be a problem, but I was good enough that I could always make it work because what they do is usually they come in, they put the sheet music down in front of all the gunslingers and they'll tell you we're playing it exactly like this, or you have some latitude, whatever. He said, I couldn't do that, but luckily I knew a few of the people there and everybody knew I was good enough that I could make it work even though I couldn't read the sheet music, which tells you another thing, that it is unusual for the best of the best at that period of time to not be formally trained and read music. Well, and Jimmy Page was a uh, session player going back to when he was 17 years old. And originally, Page couldn't read music. He had to teach himself to read music in order for him to be a session player going forward. So, you know, it's having the ability to read music is very important if you're a, a session musician is every session player going to be able to read music you know no but the vast majority of them yes that's the business you know like you said crow they're going to put sheet music in front of them you got to be able to read it it's crazy and we're getting ready to close here but let's when i was young had someone suggested to me that glenn campbell could probably blow the doors off jimmy page and just sheer guitar shredding skill i i wouldn't have even considered it But right now, if someone asked me who are some of the most talented musicians, it wouldn't even be in the rock genre. I mean, it would. There are a few. But like even people like Roy Clark, there were people on that cheesy Southern show, Hee Haw. There are a couple there that are among the best musicians you'll ever see. And they do it across multiple instruments. It's just crazy. And that's what I begin to really admire is the skill level and to get away. But Jason, anything you want to add in? This is our big music episode. Right. Uh, Well, country music is a different animal altogether. Nashville is still very much a cutthroat kind of, uh, you better be damned good if you want to attempt to make something of yourself there. You know, I'll close with this conspiratorial idea. I have always suspected that there is some kind of a tie between the $6 million man, Lee Majors, and Glenn Campbell. Have either of you ever thought that? No, that's a new one on me. (laughs) Put them next to each other. There's something going on. I already know there's something going on with Lee Majors. We've covered it before. He was, I don't know whether he was a double agent or what, but there's something there. It's even covered in the movie Argo, which is really where the red 
the red bell got rang for me. But Mike, anything else you want to add before we tell folks where they can find you? No, I think we, we covered a lot of ground, Crow and Jason. It was a very enjoyable show to sit in on and, uh, and contribute to. You know, part of the idea is funny is what we're basically saying is maybe the old Zen monk on top of the mountain was true. Um, just live in the minute, appreciate the music right in this minute and let the rest of it go. You know, don't worship the guitarist, don't worship the album cover, don't, you know, just appreciate things in the minute. Maybe that helps you dodge some of the programming bullets. But in my mind, it took me a few years to get over the betrayal that I felt when I had to realize that I had absolutely been programmed by my own decision to like things. But with that, Mike, tell folks where they can find you. My hub website, folks, sageofquay.com, S-A-G-E-O-F-Q-U-A-Y. It's all there. My music's there. My work on the Beatles is there and work in other areas. All of the links are on the website. All right, Jason, anything you want to add in before I close, uh, close up shop for today? Mike, good on you for still making music and recording your own original stuff and putting it out there. Love it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, man, you're skilled. I've heard your music and it's impressive. And that's another thing that's always gotten me. You know, you look at someone like like you, Mike, or even Jason, or someone like the conspiracy music guru. You guys have every bit of talent that would be required to be in 90% of the bands that get famous. And yet you're not. Why is that? And I think we kind of covered it, but that's it. I'm going to bring uh hour two of episode 496 to a close. And I'd like to wish everybody out there a happy, healthy, and higher-minded new era. Cheers.